The beliefs which we have the most warrant for have no safeguard but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. Command and obedience are but unfortunate necessities of human life. Society in equality is its normal state. The yoke is naturally and necessarily humiliating to all persons except the one who is on the throne, together with, at most, the one who expects to succeed to it. I have learned to seek my happiness by limiting my desires rather than in attempting to satisfy them. War is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling that thinks that nothing is worth war is much worse. The person who has nothing for which he is willing to fight, nothing which is more important than his own personal safety, is a miserable creature and has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. No one can be a great thinker who does not recognize that as a thinker, his first duty is to follow his intellect wherever it may lead. Truth gains more even by the errors of one who, with due study and preparation, thinks for himself than by the true opinions of those who only hold them because they do not suffer themselves to think. Society between equals can only exist on the understanding that the interests of all are to be regarded equally. A person may cause evil to others not only by his actions, but by his inaction. And in either case, he is justly accountable to them for the injury. The fatal tendency of mankind to leave off thinking about a thing when it is no longer doubtful is the cause of half their errors. Who can compute what the world loses in the multitude of promising intellects combined with timid characters who dare not follow out any bold, vigorous, independent train of thought, lest it should land them in something which would admit of being considered irreligious? or immoral. Of all difficulties which impede the progress of thought and the formation of well-grounded opinions on life and social arrangements, the greatest is now the unspeakable ignorance and inattention of mankind in respect of the influences which form human character. No one but a fool, and only a fool of a particular description, feels offended by the acknowledgement that there are others whose opinion, and even whose wish, is entitled to a greater amount of consideration than his. Who doubts that there may be great goodness and great happiness 
and great affection under the absolute government of a good man. Meanwhile, laws and institutions require to be adapted, not to good men, but to bad. It is not because men's desires are strong that they act ill. It is because their consciences are weak. To say that one person's desires and feelings are stronger and more various than those of another is merely to say that he has more of the raw material of human nature and is therefore capable, perhaps of more evil, but certainly of more good. The will of the people, moreover, practically means the will of the most numerous or the most active part of the people. The majority, or those who succeed in making themselves accepted as the majority, the people, consequently, may desire to oppress a part of their number, and precautions are as much needed against this as against any other abuse of power. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. The only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. That so few dare to be eccentric marks the chief danger of our time. On the average, a person who cares for other people, for his country or for mankind, is a happier man than one who does not. But of what use is it to preach this doctrine to a man who cares for nothing but his own ease or his own pocket? He cannot care for other people if he would. It is like preaching to the worm who crawls on the ground how much better it would be for him if he were an eagle. Whatever we may think or affect to think of the present age, we cannot get out of it. We must suffer with its sufferings and enjoy with its enjoyments. We must share in its lot, and to be either useful or at ease, we must even partake its character. No longer enslaved or made dependent by force of law, the great majority are so by force of poverty. They are still chained to a place, to an occupation, and to conformity with the will of an employer, and debarred by the accident of birth, both from enjoyments and from the mental and moral advantages which others inherit without exertion and independently of desert. That this is an evil equal to almost any of those against which mankind have hitherto struggled, the poor are not wrong in believing. Is it a necessary evil? They are told so by those who do not feel it, by those who have gained the prize in the lottery of life. But it was also said that slavery, that despotism and all the privileges of oligarchy were necessary.